Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Gabe Scheinman. I'm the executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Uh, it's great to have you join us. Uh, it's also uh, wonderful uh, to have so many new folks join us as well. For those who are not familiar with us, uh, we are a nonprofit national organization uh, dedicated to identifying, educating, and launching young men and women into the foreign policy world, imbued with what we call Hamiltonian principles. Uh, we have chapters on 55 college campuses across the country, uh, chapters in Washington, D.C. Uh, and New York City, as well as a large alumni network uh, that are working in and around these issues. Uh, if you're interested in more about what we do, you can go to alexanderhamiltonsociety.com. Uh, today, it's a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, somebody that I don't actually think needs an introduction, but I'll, I'll do it a, a little bit anyways, um, because I think it's a name uh, and an author you're everyone's very familiar with. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have Robert Kagan uh, here to discuss his newest book. Uh, Dr. Kagan is a Stephen and Barbara Friedman Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. He's also a contributing columnist at the Washington Post an author of some of the most influential books on American diplomatic history, uh, including but not limited to uh, The World America Made, uh, The Jungle Grows Back, Return of History and the End of Dreams, and of Paradise and Power. Uh, those books uh, might seem more like short essays uh, compared to the book he's actually uh, written and, and here to discuss today, uh, which is actually the second volume uh, of a series that he started that came out, I think, first 15 or 16 years ago, uh, called Dangerous Nation, um, which was a history of America's place in the world uh, in the 19th century. And today, we're, we're delighted to have him speak on the second volume of that history, the recent release, The Ghost at the Feast, uh, America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900 to 19th. 1941. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for joining us, and it's great to host you for another talk. Well, thank you, Gabe. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Alexander Hamilton Society. I think you guys are doing great work, and uh, and congratulations. Well, congratulations to you on on, on a book. It's a it's a, as as, as uh, you, people could see here, it's it's, it's a pretty big book, uh, but it's not only uh, well documented. It's a great book of history. It's also uh, very well written. I think easy to manage. It's not hard to uh, follow protagonists and antagonists that are themes uh, over the course of fifty years that aren't necessarily embodied individual people. Um, but we'll get into some of the individual people. So um, the book, the subtitle actually says nineteen hundred to nineteen forty one. Um, the book actually really starts in 1897, 1898, uh, with sort of the, the outset of the Spanish-American War. Um, maybe you can actually talk to us, what does world order actually look like in 1898? Like when the United States looks out, uh, not only beyond its shores, but in general, uh, what does it see? Um, and that might help us better understand some of the decisions it makes or, or, or doesn't make, obviously, in the years ahead. Well, thanks. It's a it's a it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it because one of the things that I try to do in this book is to is to look at the world not as we see it retrospectively, uh, but to try to understand the way the world looked to people at the time. You know, we live uh, history forward, but we write history backward, and we tend to be a little bit condescending in our view of our of our predecessors. Um, but they really are very much like us, and they look at the world very much as we do. But the world that people looked at in 1898 was, of course, a very different world than today. Um, and I'm not sure, and, and, I, and I sort of address this a little bit in the book, I'm not sure Americans were conscious of there being a world order um, at the time, because they played virtually no role in upholding that order. They were the beneficiaries of an order that was at the time upheld by uh, primarily the British Navy, which dominated the oceans uh, throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century, which uh, allowed for a free and relatively safe international commerce. And even though the United States was probably the least uh, dependent on trade of any of the major powers, nevertheless, Americans were quite enriched uh, by this international environment. They obviously were beneficiaries of flows of financing because much of American development was financed by British in particular uh, money. Uh, but they also, as I say, were beneficiaries of an open economic trading system in which they were sort of built to flourish. Uh, in addition to which, however, they, they paid no uh, price for living in this relatively benevolent environment. Um, the, there was no new, real military to speak of. Uh, you know, we're talking about a few thousand forces that was mostly engaged uh, in dealing with um, uh, Native Americans, uh, but was certainly not ready for any kind of world role. 
Um, so the Americans live very comfortably in a world defended by the British Navy, and which uh, also depended on a relatively stable balance of power in Europe, um, which was uh, at the end of the 19th century on its way to collapsing with the rise of Germany. So um, I think in 1898 and, and afterwards, I remember I, was, I read some journalists writing about how for Americans, even though they were very enthusiastic about the intervention in Cuba, uh, and, and were not, they were not that troubled by the acquisition of the Philippines, although it was controversial, but basically uh, Americans did not, as he said, have world power on the menu. They were not thinking of themselves as a world power. They still thought of themselves as a regional power. They still wanted to sort of uh, live within the Western hemisphere and not, and not have any global responsibilities. Of course, that was going to change when that order that they didn't know existed collapsed around them. So, but in, so in 1898, Spanish-American War, uh, in that war, the United States relatively quickly um, dispatches uh, uh, several Spanish fleets, uh, takes control of the Philippines, uh, which holds for nearly a half century, takes control of Cuba uh, for a couple of years and then uh, lets it go, although there's obviously a, a long history after that, um, as well as uh, Puerto Rico and so forth. Many consider that a turning point in American war policy. You do not. I mean, you say so explicitly in the book. Um, on, the, on the face of it, we acquire territory, we acquire far-flung territory, and the Philippines is something different. In the book, you talk about how that was uh, accidental in nature. I'd love to have you talk a little bit about that. But why do you think, why do you not consider it a turning point, and why do you think uh, uh, the conventional wisdom is wrong on that? Right. Well, the conventional wisdom is that this is when the United States became a quote-unquote world power. That's one general view. And the other general view, of course, is this is when America became an empire, a formal empire, because it acquired an actual colony uh, uh, that it occupied, it, as you mentioned, in the Philippines. Um, but, and that, you know, that looking back, of course, we, we, we see that this is when the United States became uh, a significant power in the world, and it was really on its way to being the strongest power in the world. But again, that is not what Americans had in mind. They were aware of America's wealth and capacity, but they were not, as I say, thinking of the United States as a world power. And we have to understand, um, I think, something that's been really lost, and I would say distorted by most American historians, that the impulse to intervene in Cuba was almost entirely a humanitarian impulse. Uh, you know, you you when you read about that uh, conflict and the events leading up to the American intervention, I find incredibly short shrift given to the fact that roughly a fifth of the Cuban population uh, was killed by a combination of the civil conflict with Spain, but even more importantly, by Spanish policies that produced mass starvation uh, and disease throughout the Cuban islands. So imagine a situation today where hundreds of thousands of Cubans or uh, people on any other island, whether it would be Haiti or Dominican Republic or what have you, hundreds of thousands dying clearly as a result of oppressive foreign government uh, activity um, and Americans felt that, yeah, we're, we're strong enough, so if we don't do something about this that's happening 90 miles from our shores, what kind of people are we? Um, and this, by the way, came very close on the heels of the Armenian genocide, which, um, which occurred in the 1894-1895 period, which also attracted huge emotion and attention in the United States. And for a lot of Americans, and I, I quote some newspapers making this point at the time, uh, Cuba was, quote unquote, our Armenia. And, and Americans were determined to do better than they thought the British and other Europeans had done in saving uh, the Armenians from their genocide. So it was, a, it was a humanitarian intervention. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I came across that I was most struck by we all know about Mark Twain, and Mark Twain was a leading anti-imperialist, and there were books about Mark Twain and how he, you know, fought the good fight against American imperialism. Almost never mentioned, as far as I could tell, is the fact that Mark Twain seriously and strenuously supported the intervention in Cuba. He thought it was the most noble act that the United States or perhaps any country had ever undertaken. 
His objection came when the United States wound up acquiring the Philippines, a, a question that you've raised and which we can get into. But I think we need, it's very important that it was not an imperialist instinct that led Americans into Cuba. It was a humanitarian instinct, which I think we probably ought to be able to recognize in ourselves even today. And the result of not understanding that has been a terrible distortion uh, of what the purposes of American foreign policy were in this period. Was it was it at least a turning point in terms of our ability to do something about this? I mean, those instincts, as you point out, for you didn't quite put the two words together of humanitarian, humanitarian intervention, but an intervention uh, on behalf of uh, to, to, to save or improve the lot, let's say, uh, of these peoples. But as you said, that is in keeping with a lot of the ways that we saw ourselves uh, going back a very, very long time. So uh, there's a difference between having that instinct or that motivation or the rationale for doing something about it versus actually having the capability to do something about it. So is, th is there a turning point, at least in terms of American power, or you still don't think that's quite true? Well, I think that America probably had the capability to do that in earlier phases of this crisis. After all, the Cuban crisis is, doesn't just appear in the eight, late 1890s. It's been going on for decades. Um, the United States almost went to, people forget this too, the United States almost went to war over Cuba with Spain in 1873. Um, there was a famous uh, 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 you know, because Cuban America, Cubans moved to America, became American citizens, and then tried to help their Cuban compatriots uh, uh, deal with the Spanish uh, oppression. And one of the things that they did was sort of uh, hire old Confederate ships to run guns. And one of these ships called the Virginia um, was captured by the Spaniards, and they executed everybody on the ship. They executed the captain, and they executed all the crew, and also some passengers. And, and, and literally the United States was ready to go to war. Spain apologized, pulled back, et cetera. So um, it wasn't the case that America couldn't have done what they did, uh, Americans couldn't have done what they did in 1898 earlier. But, but about one thing you're certainly right, and that is that obviously the United States would not have tried to intervene in Cuba if, it, if, if Americans didn't believe they had the power to do so successfully, and they did. But I, I think in your question, you were also getting to whether this led them to see or whether this increased the fact of the war, increased American capacities, increased America's reach, uh, increased, increased America's ability to be a global power. And the answer to that is actually no, not because it couldn't have theoretically, but in reality, that was not what Americans were interested in. And the, the why, the, the where this is most obvious is in what happened in the Philippines after the United States acquired it? Um, and the answer is, bases were never fortified. It was not used as a stepping stone, as many historians suggest it was meant to, uh, into a greater involvement in Asian politics and Asian economics. The United States perpetually continually turned down opportunities to become more involved uh, in Asian politics, even after the acquisition of the Philippines. And again, you know, being a world power is a state of mind. It is not just a cap capacity. Did Americans have the theoretical capacity to be a world power in 1900? Absolutely. Did they see themselves as a world power in 1900? Very few did. Did the, let me ask it differently. Did the Europeans see uh, our uh, conquest of the Philippines, our defeat of the Spanish as a turning point in our arrival as a world power. I mean, obviously, Dangerous Nation, the, the first volume you wrote, uh, makes a very clear case that uh, the European elites saw from the very beginning uh, of the Republic uh, that the United States had the capacity to be able to do this. Uh, sometimes the way Hamilton wrote and the way some of the Europeans wrote, they saw these things actually the same way, uh, funnily enough. Uh, and uh, there's some great quotes in the book about seeing, Her you know, Europeans seeing the United States as Hercules in the cradle and so forth. Right. Was Is this the moment that they started seeing the United States as a, as a having arrived and as a consequence to the, to, the, to the subtitle of the book, should be involved in some of these questions of world order, or do they still, or, or, or doesn't quite, again, not quite get them there? Yeah, no, I, it, unfortunately, uh, they, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but their, their basic response to all this was that they did not feel differently. Now, did the Europeans view the United States differently? Uh, to some extent, they did, obviously, although, again, it was more like the unhappiness that they had with Americans back in the early 19th century. The Kaiser Wilhelm, for instance, uh, uh, calls on the other European 
heads of state, by which you mean crowned heads of state, uh, to join together against this upstart democracy, which is very much what Metternich sounded like talking about America uh, in the 1820s and 30s. However, that being said, uh, I, I, I ran across, and I, I quote in the book, um, discussions by British foreign policy heads and strategists and whatever. And it was very clear to them that despite the fact that the United States had taken the Philippines, the United States was not an empire, did not think in terms of empire. I mean, if you think about what the British empire was at that time, um, you know, Britain had an empire that literally spanned the globe, that had hundreds of millions of subjects, um, and, and not to mention hundreds of millions of square miles of territory. And honestly, from the British point of view, as well as from the French point of view, uh, and, and, in, and basically from compared to any major empire that existed at the time, the Americans were regarded as pikers. Um, you know, it may have seemed like a big imperial jump for Americans to have acquired a colony, and it, and it was, although it was not as different as Americans thought from what they had done on the continent in the 19th century. That's another reason why I, I sort of reject the notion that this is a big break and a big discontinuity. Because of course, if you wanted to find out, if you wanted to say what was the imperialist period of American history, it was the 19th century. It was actually, it was the 18th and 19th centuries because even as Anglo-American colonists about the United States, the, the colonial America was expanding prodigiously uh, and taking over territory that had been controlled by others, Native Americans, French, Spaniards, Russians, and ultimately uh, English. So it wasn't as if Americans had never uh, conquered anything before. And in this respect, I think the Philippines was really a one-off. It was no one's intention prior, no one's intention. And this includes Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge and all those other people that are usually cited as being imperialists, it was no none of their intention to take the Philippines when the Cuban American when the Cuban intervention began. That was something that happened as a result of the conflict and the, the the nature of the naval battle. And we can discuss all that, but it's important to understand that taking the Philippines was no one's goal. It was an accident, and most Americans regarded it as an accident. And I think you know if you I I, I came across a very interesting comment by William Howard Taft who was Roosevelt's you know, uh, mentee and who became governor in the Philippines. And his attitude, which I think was that of most Americans, was that it was unfortunate that the United States had acquired the Philippines, but now that it had, uh, America, America had an obligation uh, to the people of the Philippines. Now you can regard this cynically or hypocritically or what have you, but it was a very genuine feeling at the time. Uh, but but the, what I'm trying to point out is uh, it was nowhere greeted as a great accomplishment for the United States that they acquired the Philippines. If anything, it was regarded as an unfortunate uh, uh, accident. The, 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 and, and you get obviously spent on, if not the largest chunk of the book on, on the period after World War I, but the period after World War I is often regarded as the United States, you know, re reluctantly gets involved. Uh, seems to understand uh, the, the need to take on a certain amount of responsibility uh, for uh, uh, fixing the current problem and then trying to make it better over the longer term. Uh, and then for a variety of reasons that we'll get into some of them, uh, ends up uh, collapsing that position or drawing back and so forth. Seems to me what you're saying is that the way in which it acted even after the Spanish-American War, uh, so you know, from from even in the early days of 1898, let alone 1901 or 1902, uh, even up until World War One, uh, that is not that different than how it acted in 1918, 1919, all the way up until you know the late 1930s. I mean, do you, do you are the parallels there the same for you? Well, obviously, the the you know getting involved in Europe was a different matter than getting involved in Cuba. I mean, Americans had since the time of Thomas Jefferson assumed that Cuba was eventually going to be part of the United States. So, and it was 90 miles away. Whereas Europe, you know, getting involved in Europe was a, was a major no-no ever since Washington and Jefferson. Uh, and so it was a much bigger step for Americans. And of course, sending, you know, 2 million and eventually we would have been sent 4 million troops to Europe is different from sending a few thousand uh, troops led by people like Theodore Roosevelt on horseback uh, uh, in Cuba. So it was a much larger undertaking. And I do want to say one thing, by the way, Americans, did, Americans <laughs> tried to stay out of the war 
uh, for, from August 1914 until early 1917. Um, but when they went to war, they did not go to war reluctantly. That, that is something I, I, I think it's important for people to understand. Americans entered the World War, Americans under World War I with enormous enthusiasm. There were dissenters. There were 50 members of Congress who voted against the war or voted against the uh, ex declaration of belligerency. Um, but but that, they were a minority and they were a besieged minority and Americans went into the war overwhelmingly enthusiastically and feeling that they were on the right side. And, and in terms of parallels, it is important, I think, to understand that in both cases, the motives behind American action were ultimately not material. Uh, yes, Americans were upset that ships, trading ships might be sunk on the Atlantic, but there was an answer to that. Americans could have uh, suspended that trade as, as they later did uh, as a result of the Neutrality Acts in the 1930s. The Neutrality Acts were a response uh, to the decision to, to war in, uh, to go to war, uh, which, which they regarded as partly over trade, but it wasn't really over trade. It was ultimately a response to fear, uh, which I think is a common theme uh, throughout American history, um, that that a militaristic uh, uh, authoritarian regime, uh, which is what uh, uh, Wilhelmine Germany was at the time, was go was in the process of conquering all of Europe, uh, and that this was ultimately something that the United States should not tolerate. There's a lot of talk at the time by Walter Lippmann and others about defending the Atlantic community, by which it was meant not just the geographical entity, but also a political, ideological, economic entity. That was the liberal, the Atlantic world was the liberal world at that time. And I think ultimately, uh, just as Americans went to war in Cuba for humanitarian reasons, uh, they ultimately went to war in World War I for ideological reasons uh, having to do with liberal democracy. And so, uh, you know, that's important to remember. And then what happened comes after that is the great disillusionment uh, uh, with the consequences of World War I, and then partisan politics playing a critical role in the debate over the League of Nations. All of its issues we can get into, or people can read them in the book if we no, want but that, to. And, uh, no, no, and I agree. And I didn't mean to suggest that um, when the United States did go to war in World War I, that we we were reluctant to do so. No, no, I understand. It, 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 it was it was more that when I when I read. And I've read a lot about the Spanish-American War and World War I in many ways. But when I read your book, I was just struck by the, the parallels, the, the before, during, and after when you look at the Spanish-American War and you look at World War I, uh, which is uh, concerns about what's going on, but uh, a reluctance or, or, or sure. uh, desire to sort of stay a little bit out of it, uh, a, a uh, the, the best last resort uh, policy to try and do something about it, do so decisively, uh, and then it sort of succumbs, uh, disillusionment, uh, partisan politics, a number of different things. Uh, and you can fast forward, you know, basically 15 or 20 years, and it seems like very much the same thing. And yet, in our history, as, as we discussed earlier, the Spanish-American War seems to be considered the turning point for American world affairs. And then the aftermath of World War One seems to be this, uh, the, 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 the wave receding from the shore uh, in, in that name. And so... And there is, you know, that that is there is truth to that sort of arc uh, uh, of the story, because I and I and again, I mean, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize is we think Americans transformed themselves into, as as we say, a world power, uh, and it was very clear that they were not really interested in being a world power, even after they clearly had behaved as a world power. I mean, it's only as a world power that the United States uh, enters World War I and basically decides the outcome. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a complicated story because of course Americans barely got into the fighting uh, at the very end, but it was the introduction of, and the, and, and the promise of millions of fresh troops coming from North America, as not to mention the finances and the equipment that would ultimately be uh, developed that convinced the Germans that they had no chance. They went immediately from thinking that they were about to win the war um, in July of 1918 to deciding that they were finished uh, right. and, and, and suing for surrender. And so, uh, you know, it, it, but, but again, it, Americans played that role, but almost, but almost immediately when asked uh, now, and this is a complicated story as to exactly how they answered the question and how it was asked. But when, in the in the largest sense, when asked if they wanted to continue playing 
this role in Europe, which was what essentially uh, Wilson and the Versailles Treaty required, uh, they were perfectly willing to be persuaded not to, uh, and, and then to step away and allow events in Europe to take their course, which, you know, in my view, it's precisely in the aftermath of World War I that the liberal order, which had a chance of being cemented, is essentially allowed to begin to, to fray and ultimately fall apart in the 1930s. Uh, so before I want to turn to that period, but one one more larger arc question, let's say, um, the the late nineteenth century is also the period where uh, the the nature or our understanding of uh, liberal republics around the world starts to change. Uh, we have a you know when when the, when the United States was birthed, we really did see ourselves as exceptional. There were no other liberal republics around the world, uh, and a lot of uh, the the warnings I mean, you cited earlier, kind of Washington and Jeff Jefferson and so forth, and Hamilton for that matter too, uh, about uh, entanglement or permanent alliances or so forth, was also driven by the fact that we didn't have others like us, and so their interests or are getting involved in their interests uh, were not necessarily all pecuniary, but they were certainly not for the betterment of the people or supported by them in that way because the British were monarchy and so were the French and so on and so forth. This is different in this period. Um, uh, it, and it marks also a, 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 a different an opening of a new period, let's say, of the 20th century uh, in terms of how the United States looks at these things. How did this shift in your mind affect the views of our leaders uh, when it came to how forward leaning or how ambitious, let's say, uh, American foreign policy ought to be uh, in this, you know, I don't want to say interwar because it's not World War One, World War Two, but uh, from the Spanish-American War to, to World War One. Well, that's that's an interesting question, and I'm not I'm not sure that that there really was that much of a change in that period. I mean, it, it, it even then, you know, it's interesting. In 1900, we may feel in retrospect that the world was a more democratic place than it obviously had been in, say, 1800. Um, but really, if you look around the world, yes, there were there was a liberal democracy in Britain. There was a liberal democracy in France, uh, and maybe you know, and in a few other places in in northern, fundamentally northern Europe, um, and 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 some liberalizing in in Spain and elsewhere at that time, um, and then you had, of course, the United States. But you know, even so, look who's still in power in up until World War One. The Romanov dynasty, which is now, you know, hundreds of years old, the Hohenzollern dynasty in Germany, which is hundred, they're still in charge. It, it's still, you know, uh, you've still got a monarchy in, in England, which which people are taking still taking seriously as as a as a monarchy. And so I wouldn't want to overstate the degree to which, you know, America suddenly found itself in a conducive world. It did not. It did not feel that way. And of course, Americans always had ambivalent attitudes towards the British anyway. I think what happened was a combination of the starkness of the challenge from Germany at that time. And I think that's something that also we have been has been lost in the recounting of the history of World War I, that it was very much an ideological struggle. It was not just great powers stumbling into war with ambitions and insecurities and et cetera, all the things that are the stuff of international relations theory. Both the Germans and their opponents agreed actually that this was a fight over different types of society with the Germans feeling that their, what they called their Kultur with a K, capital K, uh, their, system which basically elevated the state over the individual and it was the individual service to the state that mattered not the state's service to the individual and they contrasted that with the sort of uh, commercialism the individualism the selfishness the pettiness of liberal democracies and we should understand this today because that is the same thing that you will hear from uh, autocratic regimes like China and, and Putin. The critique of liberalism uh, has always has always been very similar. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that is the world that that Americans are, are are dealing with, and that is what people believe to be at stake uh, in World War One. Not just matters of trade, not just geopolitics, but the very idea. And I think you know, even though. World War I then leads to the disillusionment and the policies of the 1920s and 30s, et cetera. 
Uh, when you get back to America returning to involvement in the late 1930s and obviously 1940, 1941, uh, you, what you see is a return to that fundamentally ideological perspective um, that, that which they had already felt once and, ex and acted on once, then tried to turn away from. In many respects, the 20s and 30s are about America trying to contain, like deliberately containing its ideological affinities uh, for democracy overseas and its hostility uh, to uh, fascism and communism and other forms of authoritarianism. So you I mean, you, you lump the 20s and 30s together, but I think in the book you make the case that right. um, it's really focusing on the period of the 20s, because the 30s are the, just the, the manifestations, let's say, of those uh, decisions or, or uh, inactions in different ways. Um, you also use the word disillusionment a lot, um, which is not the word I think we typically now looking back of think of the 20s and 30s, we think of isolationism, which is a little bit different. But what is it that we were disillusioned with? Was it the, the cost uh, of of trying to maintain the order, the 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 burden uh, that would come with it, the seeming um, uh, 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 contradictions or hypocrisy that might come with it. I mean, the the episode with the Philippines. I think you make a convincing case that it was ugly, um, and we knew that, uh, and that was also part of who we were at the same time. So, what is it that Americans are objecting to uh, in the 1920s that leads us to uh, you know take these decisions? I mean, we're certainly engaged diplomatically. Um, in a variety of ways, the Washington Naval Treaties, uh, you know, Versailles, despite, you know, what happens afterwards, right? Uh, but we clearly also uh, abandon, let's say, uh, the role that we later think is deemed necessary. So what is it that we are disillusioned with? It, it's, a, it's, a, it, the, it's a good question, and the answer is a complicated answer. Um, you know, first of all, you know, who was disillusioned is the first question, because there's, you know, as, as we know, and it's very difficult <laughs> to have a conversation, but when you when you acknowledge this, but we have to accept there's no such thing as what the American people thought. We're a, we're a deeply, you know, we have many variegated people with very different ideas and obviously engaged always in the political struggle and ideological struggle at home, which has an, which has an effect on way different Americans uh, view foreign policy. So we were, you know, we couldn't get away from our own disputes when we looked at foreign policy matters. But so it was primarily first a liberal disillusionment. And what it was a liberal dis disillusionment was, was the was the nature uh, of the Versailles Treaty and the peace, which, um, you know, Wilson, when he was trying to stay out of war, uh, talked about a peace without victory uh, and, and, and a war in which basically uh, Germany, if it was defeated, would not be humiliated, would not be occupied, would not be torn apart, et cetera. Uh, there was a general sense in America, certainly, that although we were on the British and the French side, uh, you know, we also want, you know, once Germany was defeated, we should be good to the Germans. It was a very generous approach, which I, to some extent we took after World War II as well. And it came to be believed that uh, the, tre the treaty was very harsh on the Germans and a lot of American liberals thought that was not what they signed up for. And to some extent, you know, Wilson was a victim of his own rhetoric. I think as a, in, in terms of his actual behavior, he was a very practical man dealing with very practical problems, but he spoke in the loftiest idealistic language, which a lot of his followers really ate up. And so, when he came, I think the Versailles Treaty was a perfectly reasonable compromise of a lot of very complicated issues, and it was a, not a terrible peace treaty, as these things go. Uh, but there were many aspects of it that Americans found objectionable uh, from a sort of moral and political point of view. For I'll just give you a for instance. Uh, Wilson has to make a compromise in the course of the treaty in order to keep the Japanese on board. He allows them to keep the Shantung province territory that they took from the Germans and the Germans, which the Germans had taken from the Chinese earlier. Now, it, it should have been returned to China, uh, but the Japanese insisted on holding it. And ultimately, uh, Wilson and the rest of other, others gave in on that. That was a source of, of great unhappiness. So there was the disillusionment with the treaty. But then there was also the, the domestic politics of it all and the role of Henry Cabot Lodge and the Republican leadership uh, in defeating the League. Why? Not because it, they really thought it was a terrible thing, because Lodge himself had once recommended a League of Nations. Roosevelt 
Theodore Roosevelt wrote a long series of essays recommending a League of Nations before Wilson had even signed up to the idea. Uh, but in order to defeat Wilson uh, and to win the presidential election in 1920, I know we're shocked to hear that people play politics with foreign policy, uh, but in order to defeat Wilson and make sure Republicans got back in the White House in 1920, Lodge felt he must defeat the League, and he was probably right. And so he defeated the League. And so between the liberal disillusionment and then the political defeat of the League, uh, it's probably not surprising that Americans looked at all of this and said, this is a big mess. In addition to which, and I'll, I'll end on this point so we can keep moving on, but the Versailles Treaty uh, gets a lot of criticism uh, from historians and, and international relations theorists uh, and others uh, for not, you know, for not being an effective treaty, whether it was too tough on the Germans or too soft on the Germans, pick, pick your criticism. But I, I really think people have forgotten that the Versailles Treaty was never supposed to operate without the United States. The United States was the long pole in the tent of the treaty. Why? Because the United States was the one that had changed the balance of power in Europe by introducing itself. And it was on that changed balance of power that the Versailles Treaty was supposed to be based. When the United States pulled out of the treaty, it shifted the balance of power back in favor of at least a theoretical Germany. And the rest of the 1920s and 30s are about not successfully dealing with how do you allow Germany to return to being a great power without threatening the rest of Europe again. The American uh, role was the answer to that problem, just as the American role would be the answer to that problem after World War II. I mean, that is the great American contribution to European peace is was that the United States stayed in Europe so that Germany would not pose a threat. Germany could be allowed to grow and prosper without posing a dire threat once again to France. So the treaty collapsed because the Americans pulled out. But of course, then the Americans looked at Europe and said, look, it's a mess. The treaty is a disaster. So why would we want to get involved? You know, so in a way, it was a self-fulfilling uh, disillusionment. The Americans made it worse and then were able to point to how bad it was. Um, and, you, and that, you, you, you kind of went in the direction of where I wanted to ask my next question anyways. But I do want to put a finer point on, on what you just said, which is and 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 and, and ask you maybe to clarify a bit. Um, a lot of the criticism of both the Versailles settlement uh, 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 the the League of Nations Pact was even if the United States were involved, it was set up in such a way that it was not going to be the structure that would be able to maintain the order. And the reason that we know this now is because after World War II, we didn't we didn't adopt the exact same structure. We actually did do something different. Um, and so, putting aside, I don't want to put you in the in the uh, I don't want to lead you down the path of counterfactual history. Uh, that's hard and unfair to everybody involved. Uh, but um, you, what you seem to be saying, and I just want to clarify is that it's at not actually what was devised, it was you think just the absence of the United States to be able to make it effective? Um, or do you think that there actually were problems with the way the post World War One settlement was uh, put together or the order that was attempted to be constructed, even if the United States had taken the role it was supposed to? Well, look, let, let's talk in concrete terms, because, the, you know, I think sometimes and not, not I'm not saying this is about you, but I do think in general discussion is occurs at a kind of abstract level about what kind of system, you know, you're setting up. But but Wilson and everybody else at Paris in 1919 was faced with one very basic concrete problem, which was how does how do you assure French security? while also allowing Germany to get back on its feet. And by the way, one of the reasons, one of the crass reasons everybody wanted Germany to get back on its feet was so that it could pay reparations to Britain and France, who in turn owed enormous billions of dollars worth of debt to the United States. And so in order for everybody to get paid, Germany had to be able to have a successful enough economy to pay the reparations so that they could pay their war debts. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 therefore, both the British and the Americans wanted to keep Germany intact um, and allowed to pursue its economic development because Germany was the engine, in addition to having to pay reparations, it was the engine of the European return to its pre-Bismarckian uh, self. Uh, 
Um, and, 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 and the French wanted, for instance, the Rhineland to be separated from Germany and either made a, a, a dependency of France or made autonomous, but in such a way that the French would control it. So that was the challenge. How do you take care of French security needs and, um, and without destroying Germany? And the answer obviously was going to be some kind of security guarantee. Um, the French wanted to oh, know- but just, to, just to add to that one thing, yeah. I assume also with a different, with a German Republic, right? I mean, it's not just right. solving that challenge, which you're obviously correct about, but it you make it that makes it seem like it's a question of material interest and in how the, the things interlock. There's the overall- point here, which I think obviously you make in the book, right, as well. Yes, although I have to say the number one motive for both the British and the Americans was to get the money, I, you know, and the French, it, a lot of it was about money. I hate to say that. But yes, the United States and Wilson in particular was committed to a German Republic uh, on the theory that, you know, otherwise it would re either return to its previous aggressive militaristic state as it was under Kaiser Wilhelm, or it would go in a communist direction, be part of the Bolshevik revolution, et cetera. So yes, the United States had an interest in a moderate, you know, liberal capitalist democratic Germany. Um, but, uh, but also a lot of it had to do with, with making these payments. So, uh, so yes, the United States had that interest, but ultimately decided as a result of all these uh, you know, domestic political fights. And, and you know, Americans, if you ask them, you know, the interesting thing is when Wilson comes back from Paris with the League Treaty uh, and the, Versa the League Agreement and the Versailles Treaty, the general assumption based on all, we didn't have, they didn't have polls at that time, but, you know, they, they had their own way of measuring public opinion. The general opinion agreed upon by both Lodge and the Democrats was that the public was in favor of the league. Um, and you really, and, and what Lodge did over the course of the next six months was one of the great feats of legislative leisure demand. Uh, you know, he used, he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and Senate Majority Leader, and he used all those powers to delay hearings on the treaty. You know, they, they spent two and a half weeks just reading the treaty out loud in committee. Um, they then brought up every conceivable critic, uh, Italian Americans who were unhappy about how the Italians fared in the settlement, you know, people who complained about the Japanese uh, taking Shantung, etc. And he built this this force against um, uh, against the treaty, and he was driven in all of this by the most radical fringe of isolationists in the Republican Party, led by people like William Bora. And the interesting thing at the time was that they did not represent a majority view in the Republican Party. The Republican Party had been the internationalist party up until this point. It was the party of Theodore Roosevelt and an internationalist, Henry Cabot Lodge. But Lodge let, created a complete shift driven again by Bora and company in the whole architecture and way of thinking about foreign policy in the Republican Party so that when Harding wins in 1920, that's the Republican Party that won. It, it is the party of William Bora, not the party of Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. And, and at the end of the day, although historians treat the policies conducted by Republicans in the 1920s, respectfully, as you do, as you suggested, they, they did economic, they had economic diplomacy, they did the Dawes plan, they, they negotiated agreements, uh, as you say, in East Asia, uh, with the naval agreement, etc. Uh, but the reality, I mean, the, the, the really important reality at the time is, they are absolutely determined not to commit to commit the United States to do anything in the world uh, that required the use of force, and even really that required an ongoing financial commitment. Uh, they wanted the United States to be free of all foreign uh, influences as much as possible. And this was not, in my view, a return to the normal American isolationism, if you will, because Americans, this is one contrast that I think is worth making. Americans from 1900 to 1914, uh, and really even 1918, were not afraid of the rest of the world. They were not hostile 
to, uh, to foreigners in the same way. Uh, but after World War I and after the Republicans take charge and the League is defeated, Americans go into a deep xenophobic period. And it, and it takes place across, it, 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 it reveals itself across the board. The most restrictive immigration legislation in American history is passed in 1924. The most uh, economic, you know, enormous, significant economic protectionist measures are undertaken in the 1920s. The, the Klan, uh, the Ku Klux Klan rises in power like it never before in the 1920s. There's a real nativist reaction in general to all things foreign, uh, which I think the battle over the league actually encouraged and led to. And then Americans became stuck very much in that mode. And I, you know, historical analogies are always dangerous, but in a way, Americans responded to World War I the way Americans have since responded to Iraq, for instance, which is interesting given how much a greater conflict World War I was than Iraq. But, but uh, you know, the disillusionment has led, led to a retrenchment uh, of American involvement, much more dramatic then than now. Uh, but you can see how the, as, you know, you, you fixed on the word disillusionment. We all know about the disillusionment that followed Iraq. I think you have to take that and multiply it actually uh, times many factors to understand the disillusionment in the, in the period of the 20s and 30s. So I want to ask one more question on that period and then and then talk about and then really end with talking about FDR, um, because I think FDR uh, is reified in the in the American uh, imagination, rightly for many reasons, but it's more complicated than that. And as I think you make the case in the book, there's there's various versions or, or various stages, let's say, uh, of FDR um, in terms of when he becomes present, when things shift. So but the question is, um, yes, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge. Warren Harding really do manage to turn what was previously Republican foreign policy on its head in a variety of ways, um, and it sends it in that way. Uh, Roosevelt, when he is finally elected, is, is, is seen or reputationally seen as an internationalist, but doesn't dramatically change the policies of the Hoover administration uh, of his predecessor for at least a few years. So who are the voices in our debate um, in the mid to late 1920s who were arguing against what were clearly the prevailing winds uh, coming out of the Warden, uh, uh, Harding and uh, Hoover administration. Um, was this a debate? I mean, if, you, you're, if you, you just said yourself, you consider this period actually more the aberration than the norm um, when you look at the longer uh, stretch of American foreign policy. But as with anything, when you dive into these things, there tend to actually be debates among some of these players. It just so happens one camp wins out. It's not that the other disappears. So who are the ones keeping that flame alive that thinks that the thought that the United States was making, you know, mistakes of, of really disastrous proportions in this period. You know, it, it, it's, it's astonishing, but, you know, that side of the argument was pretty well vanquished uh, throughout the 1920s and did not revive until the threats start emerging in the, in the mid to late 1930s. Um, it's very hard. The Democratic Party, which was at, as a result of Wilson you know, had got was all in uh, on the League of Nations and ran on the League of Nations in 1920. But the the you know Harding won in the greatest landslide in political in American electoral history. Uh, it it was a complete wipeout, and so it's not surprising that the Democrats ultimately decided that even though they kind of had to say something about the League because Woodrow Wilson was their last great president, nevertheless they knew it was a loser. Um, and Roosevelt, who was the ultimate Wilsonian, he was Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy, he was a great believer in the league, he was the vice presidential candidate in 1920 and ran very much in defense of the league. But ultimately, by the time he gets really serious about running for the presidency in the late 20s and before, you know, leading up to the 1932 election, he is compelled to renounce his views on the on the league. Uh, you know, William Randolph Hearst basically summons him uh, to 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 sort of uh, you know make some kind of whatever you I don't know what you do in a religious promise to say that you know you'll you'll worship the one true God. And uh, you know Wilson had to make it clear to William Randolph Hearst that he was really not in favor of the league anymore. And his first term in office. Uh, he sounds as much like a, as an isolationist as anybody, and that tells you something. Uh, and I think it's something that we we've seen in our own time. Uh, you know, a president may or may not have deeply held internationalist views, uh, 
But if the argument in the United States has fallen, has become so one-sided that it, it is almost unacceptable politically to say you're in favor of internationalism, then the, pol the politician is going to conform himself or herself uh, to that. And he did. Um, and it really only wasn't uh, until things in the world began to look more and more dire in his second term. Also, by the way, he also knew that he couldn't continue accomplishing his domestic objectives in his second term. And so it was nice to pivot to foreign policy, where he had a greater majority, actually, in Congress than he did on his economic reforms at that time. Uh, but in any case, you know, he ultimately had to come around. It's very hard. This is the, I mean, a theme of the book. I, uh, if you look at all these presidents, presidents do not want to be out in front of where the American people are. It's a very uncomfortable and scary position to be. Therefore, they generally try to position themselves in the dead center uh, of American opinion. And so the game, I know you're about to ask me about Roosevelt, but the game with the Roosevelt had to play was to try to push a little bit to see if he could get the American people to sort of wake up to what he thought, uh, what he saw as the growing challenges. And sometimes when he did it, it didn't work. He gave a very important speech in 1937 known as the quarantine speech in which he proposed a quarantine against the three bandit nations, as he referred to them. And it fell like a stone. And he was actually viciously attacked by Republicans for uh, trying to get us into a war. And he backed away, um, uh, you know, and that wasn't the last time that he would back away. Uh, but that that was the challenge is once a general viewpoint takes hold in the United States, it takes a combination of events and political leadership, but the events are critical uh, in order to begin to, to force a shift. And there's also, I, I can't remember which year, there's also Roosevelt's good neighbor policy, right, which he actually withdraws uh, a number of American commitments in Central America. Is that still his first term? I can't remember. Yeah, that's his first term. And the good neighbor policy is really is invented by, like so many things that Roosevelt does in his first term, Hoover, Herbert Hoover did them first. Um, and the general move uh, to withdraw American forces uh, from uh, from the Western Hemisphere, which is one the one place where it was supposed to be okay to use American force. Now it was taking place. This was all taking place at the time of the Sandino Rebellion against uh, the American backed government in Nicaragua, which led to the deployment of thousands of American troops in that conflict which people um, uh, grew very tired of very quickly. And so that was that was part of what led to the good neighbor policy. But it definitely was, as you suggest, a manifestation of the overall sentiment in the country, which went so far in the, in the direction of pulling back from the world that it even included Central America, where the United States had been engaged nonstop uh, since, uh, well, certainly for, dec for decades going back before 1900. So, so what is the moment that changes uh, in Roosevelt's uh, second term to be able to enable this? I mean, you said to yourself, he, he comes in with instincts that are, you know, certainly different than where his predecessors were, but because of politics in a variety of ways, he uh, suppresses them. I don't know what the right way is or shifts or dances um, in a variety of ways to get there. But then, you know, that starts to actually shift. I mean, there are these series of speeches, right. despite the Congress passing the neutrality acts, he also manages to work with some members of Congress and, 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 and initiate a much larger naval buildup. All of this is way before uh, uh, Pearl Harbor in a variety of right. ways. People don't right. realize this, that most of the Navy the United States fought with actually is built before that, not necessarily during it. Um, and so in the book, you talk about Kristallnacht, which actually surprised me uh, as something that, that, that seemed to motivate uh, Americans or make them aware or, or change their mindset of how serious this is. But uh, were there things that came before that as well for Roosevelt that allowed him to, to, to embark in that shift publicly? Yeah. And I do want to talk about Kristallnacht because I, uh, that is something that surprised me too. And, I, and I'll come back to that. But uh, the, the obvious, you know, it, it's not hard to see what, what, what Roosevelt was concerned about. I mean, by the time his second term begins uh, in 1937, um, first of all, the, there's there's been the uh, Italian invasion of Ethiopia uh, in 1935, which is uh, horrific. Uh, you know, it's it's Italian uh, aerial bombardment of, of 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 fighters on horseback with spears, um, and and it, it, it's it's really and that's very appalling to people. But because of the neutrality position of the United States. Uh, Roosevelt is not really able to do anything about it. There are other reasons as well. Uh, then comes the Spanish Civil War, uh, 
in which um, a, a Republican, a small R Republican, uh, sort of Democratic uh, government is under siege from, the, uh, from General Franco and fascists, and those, uh, they wind up getting direct intervention uh, uh, assistance from uh, Nazi Germany uh, and uh, Italy and Mussolini. So that's seen as a, a clear conflict between fascism on one side and a combination of liberalism and communism and socialism uh, on the other side. And then in 1937 comes the Jap, the full-scale Japanese invasion of China. Um, you know, up until then, the Chinese had invaded Manchuria. Americans were very upset about that, but they were sort of like, "What is Manchuria anyway?" Uh, but uh, but in 1937, then it, it, the, the Japanese invade. You know, what people regard as sort of the main uh, body of China, and and with leading ultimately to the atrocities in Nanking. Um, so all those things are going on, and and I think that is what alarms. Roosevelt and leads him to give this quarantine speech in 1937, which, however, as I say, uh, kind of falls flat as far as the American public reaction is concerned. The turning point for the American public, I believe, or at least the, the, the more liberal elements of the American public is, and as I say, to my surprise, I discovered is Kristallnacht because, um, and, and you know, that the interesting thing is that Kristallnacht comes uh, relatively quickly on the heels of Munich, uh, the Munich uh, agreement where where basically you know Britain and France uh, you know give Czechoslovakia to to Hitler without a fight, um, but but Americans' attitude toward Munich is kind of mixed. Uh, Roosevelt privately thinks it's a terrible sellout, but publicly he praises it, and most Americans are buying the as Neville Chamberlain said, "It's peace in our time." And so that, that's, uh, that view is, is, is that's sort of a wash for Americans. Whereas Kristallnacht was something different. And, you know, I don't know how much people remember or, or learned about what happened on Kristallnacht, but uh, suffice to say it was the worst pogrom against Jews in modern European history. It led to the destruction of thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish businesses. People, Jews committed suicide. They were beaten and killed on the streets. And they also had all their money taken from them to pay for the destruction that was carried out against them. Americans were horrified. Well, actually, I mean, Americans had two reactions to it. One, overwhelmingly, was horror. Um, and Roosevelt, I think, spoke for most Americans when he said he couldn't believe that a, civil, a supposedly civilized nation could behave this way. Um, it also led, by the way, to a rise in anti-Semitism in the United States, which is another subject that we can talk about. But just to remind us that the United States is never just one public with one set of opinions. Um, so half, you know, more than half the country was outraged by the anti-Semitic pogrom, and another some percentage of Americans became more anti-Semitic uh, as a consequence. But the overall effect was to paint a picture of what Nazi Germany and what Hitler was that was not quite as clear before. I mean, people knew that Hitler was an anti-Semite, but he himself had played down his own anti-Semitic, believe it or not, uh, of views in the early period of his rule, precisely because he feared the Western response. Um, when, when he finally unleashed this attack on Jews, uh, people really did change their view. And this is one of the great, interesting sort of stories of history in general. You know, people ask, why didn't the Americans want to go to war after the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915? Did Americans ultimately not care about the sinking of the Lusitania because it didn't go to war for another two years? And the answer is no, they weren't ready to go to war in 1915, but the sinking of the Lusitania completely changed their view of what Germany was and what Germany represented. Uh, uh, to the point where that's the point at which they started being treated as the Hun uh, and, and that they were somehow inhuman monsters, not just a different country with a different set of interests. Um, and the same happened in the case of Nazi Germany as a result of Kristallnacht. Americans were not ready to go to war in 1938 and would not be ready to go to war for years after that. But, but their view of what Nazi Germany was and what you could possibly hope to achieve in terms of working things out with a country like that, they changed irrevocably. And it's no accident uh, that really beginning in early 1939, even before Hitler invades Poland in September, 
uh, you're already seeing erosion of the strength of the Neutrality Acts, uh, and Roosevelt is beginning to make some headway in, in pushing the American public uh, to support more efforts to help uh, Britain uh, and the other victims of, of German attack. I mean, th this this question goes a little bit beyond the the, the scope of this book in particular, but. Um, do you think it's the depths of that, uh, of the understanding of the American public, of the nature of uh, fascism, of German Nazism, et cetera, that then allows them to support a much more robust uh, and forward role after the war? Whereas, again, to, to, to comparisons are always a little fraught, but uh, certainly not the same depths of views of Imperial Germany uh, prior to World War One, despite them also doing a number of horrific things in that way. Um, in that way, I mean, is, is there this before and after effect, or just two totally different things? No, no, no. I mean, I would say the Americans' response to the post World War II period you're talking about yeah. is a, is a, is the consequence of the entire all the the whole history uh, leading up to it. Yes. That there were yes, that there were there were people on the on the planet who were evil and needed to be defeated, and it was not just about geopolitics, but, but there was something that you could point to that was truly evil, uh, and therefore that America, in fighting that evil, stood for something good. But I think that when you look at the decisions taken uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, most of those decisions are about we need to get right what we got wrong after World War One. Uh, you know, much of American policy in the post-World uh, War II period is about not making the same mistakes that were made in the lead up to World War II. So, for instance, that's when America started promoting a free, you know, a relatively free trade approach to the world because they believed that the protectionist policies uh, of the 1920s and 30s helped produce the great conflict. Americans started, you know, took on responsibility for maintaining peace in Europe by keeping American troops in Europe, because they remembered that in their failure to do that after World War I led to all of this, uh, led to the disaster ultimately of the 1930s. So, so it was the whole, the whole story of, of America from, and the world from World War I through the 20s and 30s and into World War II that informed those people like Dean Acheson and Harry Truman, who had lived through all of that, you know, that, that was their, the greatest, you know, what we refer to as the greatest generation is also the generation that was not great from a certain point of view uh, from World War I on. They responded in their, you know, what they did was a response to the lessons that they themselves had learned from that period. Although we still seem to, I mean, this takes the conversation up to the modern day, we still seem to re be learning or relearning those lessons on a regular basis. I mean, the way in which in the book you describe uh, uh, McKinley's, let's say, own change of heart in terms of where he was when he entered office versus what he ended up doing, uh, Woodrow Wilson, even FDR to a certain degree, um, and, and Truman, I think we know even a bit better in the, in the post-war, um, is not that different than when you think of, uh, I don't know, George W. Bush coming in in a certain way or Obama Trump and even Joe Biden recently, right? In terms of, uh, of you know wanting to withdraw from Afghanistan, wanting to somehow freeze or stabilize Russia in such a way, and and each of them in different ways uh, end up in a place that is probably totally different than the way they would have uh, started it. And I don't know if it's just simply a well, that's that's that it's the process of elimination. I mean, this is the the least bad uh, policy or reaction to what it is, or whether it's a being shaped about this by this history um, in terms that you kind of put it in. So any, anyways, I'm curious what you think about it. I'm just struck that even today, it's not that even after World War II, we're like, okay, we got it. You know, uh, we understand <laughs> where this is. We're not going to go through that again, but but this still happens today. No, and 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 you're 100% right. And and the thing is, is that, you know, every generation has to, seems to have to learn all of the same things all over again. And, you know, as I said, the generation that that built the post World War II order would not have built that order had they not had the experience as a generation uh, of of everything that had come before. Future generations that have not had that experience obviously have not, you know, are not driven in the same way to try uh, to to undo those past errors. But but the but the continuing reality. Is is the is the paradox 
of Americans' attitude towards their interests. And that's something that we have not yet discussed, but which I think, and which I don't really get into that much in the book, but which in some respects is at the core of all this. You know, on the, on the one hand, Americans sometimes frequently believe, regard their interests as about security of the homeland and that, and, the, and you know, maybe also the economic well being of the homeland. But basically, it, it's a very, I guess, what I would call the modern tradition of, of thinking about interests fundamentally in terms of security and material terms. Um, and, and viewed from that perspective, it's entirely understandable that Americans' basic attitude should be why should we get involved anywhere? Because one of the realities of the American situation is that America is effectively invulnerable to foreign invasion. It's too big, it's too far, it's too powerful. Um, and this has been true since the turn of the century. I remember reading a British strategic assessment that says, and this was at a time when America had like 25,000 you know, ground troops, saying that the, an invasion of America is like the most impossible thing we could possibly imagine. Hitler once said, Amer I, America has as much chance of conquering the moon as I have of conquering America. Um, and so this fundamental uh, you know, sense of invulnerability would naturally lead people to say, well, then what do we care what happens out there? We're fine, uh, as long as we build a big enough Navy and take care of ourselves. So that's always part of the American thinking, even today. Um, uh, you know, not, it hasn't changed that much, even with the advent of globalization and nuclear weapons. Americans, you know, you stand on, a, on one of our shores and you look out, it, it's a really long way across the ocean, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to take seriously that anything that could happen out there could affect us. So that's one part of the, of the paradox. The other part, however, is that because Americans, America is founded on universal principles that Amer that is the only thing that really holds America together as we're discovering uh, today. And, and because America has, has by reason of uh, just circumstance, geography and power uh, is in a position uh, to have enormous impact on everything that happens in the world. And Americans can never say, well, there's nothing we can do about that. They may choose not to do something about it overseas, but it's not that they couldn't, even though sometimes they like to comfort themselves that they couldn't. Um, they know that they could. And so this tension is constantly at play. And I think it, Americans snap very quickly from, this is none of our business and we don't care, to, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing that. We need to do something. And Ukraine, not that you brought up Ukraine, and I appreciate that because I know you're, we're really trying to talk about history here and I do appreciate that, but Ukraine does illustrate this, this sort of paradox in the way Americans think about their interests. Because if you had asked anybody, you, me, any foreign policy expert, anybody on February 22nd, whether the United States had a vital interest in what happens in Ukraine, the answer would of course be no. American security is not gonna be directly affected by what happens in Ukraine. And yet Americans are poured $50 billion and risk conflict with Russia over Ukraine, why? because they see, as they saw in previous periods in their history, a real threat emerging from a great autocratic, aggressive power to the liberal democratic community, the Atlantic community, the liberal world, whatever you want to call it. It's not Atlantic anymore because it includes uh, Asia as well. But that liberal world, which the United States has fought to protect in World War I, in World War II, throughout the Cold War, and is now seeing challenged again. Um, and so that is, that is how America, you know, engages in this whiplash foreign policy, where on the one hand, we couldn't care less about what's happening. And next thing you know, we're getting very deeply involved and, and even, you know, emotionally invested uh, in the success of, a, in, the, in the preservation and defense of a people like the Ukrainians. Right. But what, what you're saying and, and what, uh, I think your work in, in this book and in others is saying is that there's there's actual order in the whiplash. There's a pattern uh, in the whiplash right. cycle uh, right. that goes through and, um, and that maybe we shouldn't be so obsessed with trying to uh, learn the cycle once and set it in stone and not have to kind of relearn it and go through it, but that going right. through it itself is actually natural in a lot of ways. That's right. That's right. I do think that the oscillation in American foreign policy turns out to be one of the characteristics of American foreign policy.
Yeah. So let me end on this question because um, we're coming up against the end of and the end of time, and and it will be speculative. So go beyond the book, which is about China. Um, you wrote a long piece uh, in the Wall Street Journal just recently. Uh, essentially, uh, I forget the way they titled it, and, and it probably wasn't your title, but essentially it's, uh, you know, uh, it's not quite come at me, dog, uh, China, but it's a little bit of maybe you ought to think twice uh, about challenging the United States, given uh, how we have dealt with previous challenges in our history. Um, and I'm just curious whether you see the nature of the China challenge maybe as different, or the way in which we might debate it, which is kind of what we just discussed, as different than some of the other things that you've done in your magnificent histories of the first, you know, almost uh, 150, 180 years of American history, first in the sense that it's it's emanating or, or, or originating in Asia, which I think is different. It might be different in the American mindset. Uh, the second is just, we may have never seen a power this economically strong, um, singularly economically strong than we have elsewhere. Um, and the third is just the nature of the era we're in is that they they seem to be be concentrating a lot of their efforts in 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 several places where they seem to have taken big advantages over us and they've managed to reach into our society directly um, in ways that are uh, quite different of, of, of both scale and scope uh, than some of our previous challengers. So I'm just I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether you see this as just the same in, in, in various patterns of these highly autocratic, that's being nice, uh, regimes that manage to be quite economically powerful and will translate that into a challenge to the world order of liberalism as we define it, uh, or that there's just something different about the nature of this challenge. Yeah, I think if, if, I, if that's a binary question and I have to pick oh. one side or the other, no, 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 I'm, I'll, I'll take it. And I would as say, gray as you want it to be. <laughs> I, will, I will say that fundamentally, I don't think the China challenge is a fundamentally different challenge than the, than the previous uh, challenges. And that's one of the points of, of the uh, article that you mentioned that I wrote in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and and, and, and I, I know that it's become somehow a kind of conventional wisdom that China is a more uh, uh, dangerous threat to the United States than those previous powers were. But I must say, one of the points of the Wall Street Journal piece is to say, in what way is that true exactly? Um, you know, there's a big problem that we have with China's GDP. If you ask someone, if, if there's, a, there's a very fine book on China's goals and by a guy named Rosh Doshi, who I think now is at, maybe at the NSC, but uh, he says that China is the greatest challenge that the United States has faced, and he, and he points to the Chinese GDP as the evidence of that. And I just think that the Chinese GDP is a very difficult concept to build a foreign policy theory around because, you know, China's GDP in 1800 was the largest GDP in the world. And it, it was completely vanquished by an island, a small island power with a GDP a fraction of its size, uh, i.e. the British. Uh, in the early 19th century. And the fact that China had the largest GDP in the world meant, meant nothing. Obviously, the Chinese GDP is in part a function of its enormous population. If you look at GDP per capita, China's not even in the same ballpark with not only the United States, but with almost all other uh, major, certainly the major democracies in the world. Now, I'm not saying that China isn't got a lot of money. They have a they have a huge sovereign wealth fund that they can spend. They obviously have a lot of money to spend on their defense budget, and they are spending it. But is it really uh, a different kettle of fish than than Nazi Germany? You know, the German economy was roaring in the late 1930s under Hitler's sort of dirigiste. Uh, approach to the economy at a time when the American economy was 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 in the tube down the tubes, um, and if you look at if you compare, and I don't like talking about GDP, but everybody <laughs> insists on talking about it. But if you compare GDPs uh, in these periods uh, today, if you look at the United States and its allies uh, in Europe and Asia, uh, that accounts for roughly fifty percent of of global GDP. If you put China and Russia together, that's about you know twenty to thirty percent of global GDP. Uh, back in the, if you go back to 1941, uh, the share of global GDP of the Axis powers, which is to say Germany, Japan, and Italy and Austria, uh, plus uh, because uh, you know from 1939 to June of 1941. Uh, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany are effectively allied in the Nazi-Soviet pact. So if you add 
uh, and Americans would have had to consider the Soviet Union a potential adversary. If you add that, uh, uh, their GDP, that total GDP was at least equal to, if not larger than the combined GDP of the United States and Great Britain. Um, and so that, you know, I don't, so in that sense, I don't see that China is a greater threat. In addition to which, look where China is starting compared to where Germany and Japan were when the United States finally engaged in trying to prevent them. By the time the United States got involved in the war, Germany had already conquered all of Europe uh, except Britain, and Japan had conquered all of East Asia. And within the first few months of 1942, Japan would conquer more territory than any country, any country in the history of the world, including the Roman Empire, you know, in terms of speed. So that was the world that the United States had to fight back against. Here today, China is surrounded by major powers that are hostile to it and, and aligned with the United States, from India to Japan to South Korea to Australia to Vietnam, uh, et cetera. And, and those are major powers. Japan is a major military power and would be even a bigger military power if it chose to, as it may be in the process of choosing. And China can't even so far take a tiny island, which it regards as essential to itself, to itself uh, namely Taiwan. So it seems to me that the China challenge is real, it's serious, we need to take it seriously, it's vitally important that we deter China, we are not spending enough money on our military in order to do that, uh, but I don't think we should treat China as an impossible uh, uh, problem for us. I think that uh, if, and this was the purpose of my article, it was not actually aimed at us, it was aimed at the Chinese as you say, I want to make it clear to them that they are making a mistake. If they think that they can pull off what previous great powers who were at least as strong as they were, were not able to pull off. Um, and that is a very bad risk that they're taking. Although, if you look at the history of the past 100 years, it's a risk that seems to be taken frequently by autocratic great powers. Well, with that, uh, Ghost at the Feast, uh, Bob, congratulations on this great book. Uh, we look forward to uh, reading volume two, which is out, uh, reading volume three, which I hope will come out uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, <laughs> and then based on the answer you just gave me, uh, hopefully there will be volume four, uh, which is the history of the years we're living through about how the United States uh, successfully took on uh, the next challenger, just like it had the previous one. So, Bob, thank you so much and congratulations on a great book. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you very much for this conversation. Great. Have a great day, everybody.